Welcome everybody. My name is Lee Alness. I'm uh, Vice Commodore of the Inland Lake Yachting Association, coming to you from White Bear Lake, Minnesota tonight. I'm really excited to kick off tonight's uh, session with Stephanie Robel and Maggie Shea. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank all of our uh, ILYA uh, uh, members, our sponsors, and in particular, the folks over at salesing.com. If you missed the first couple of sessions that we've done, be sure to go back to ILYA.org or check out salesing.com to see the replays that they've edited for you. Uh, so if you haven't checked out Salesing before, be sure to do that now. There's a wealth of great information for SCOW sailors uh, over there. Uh, Steph and Maggie don't need much introduction. Their full bio, I think, is in the invitation that you all got, uh, but they are sailing superstars who've uh, climbed the ladder to uh, world ranking of fourth, and they've qualified to compete in the upcoming Olympics in Tokyo in 2021. So we're looking forward to another great session with them tonight. Uh, stay alert. There's a lot to learn, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. So I'll turn it over to you, Steph and Maggie. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight to join us. But yeah, we're, we're excited to be back with you all tonight. Um, and we're going to be talking about upwind tactics and strategy, which is actually one of my favorite topics. I, I just absolutely love upwind tactics. So I'm um, looking forward to sharing some of our um, tips and some of the things that we've learned with you all tonight. Um, and we really just, we want to make this a, a fun discussion for everyone. So a lot of it, about 50, a lot of advanced racers here, which is exciting. Um, and actually a lot of new participants from, um, from previous weeks. So welcome everyone. Um, we're actually going to kick this off with a little bit of a, a reminder and for those of you who haven't been here before um, or actually to our first chat, um, we're going to just kind of go through this um, chart that we talked about with uh, Dave Ullman. Um, it's kind of, it's our reference for before racing um, to help us make a game plan and I think, you know, when you're talking about upwind sailing, that's your, that's your first start or your first step is to, is to make a game plan. So. We talk about what kind of race course we have. Is it an open race course in the sense that we have a really stable wind or we have a really unstable, puffy, shifty wind? Um, and then we have somewhere to race to, which is um, more wind on one side, a geographic shift, um, current advantage like in San Francisco, or persistent shift. Um, and then we break it down into um, kind of your sailing style and your priorities um, given what the situation is like. And we're going to get um, some more into all that a little bit later on, um, but just wanted to bring that up as a quick review for you all. Um, next, we're going to head into this concept of tactical intelligence that we've talked about, that we talked about in our, um, in our first webinar. And I'm going to let Maggie take it away from here with that. Yeah, I, uh, I love this one because this bottom mark picture, um, it really shows how steps like head is out of the boat and I can almost feel her thinking about like what's my next move here um and it's a moment that on our boat at the end of each leg you know when we're heading back up wind um we talk about what happened on that leg and what do we think is going to happen next um and that's something we really learned from John Bertrand in this tactical intelligence concept um the idea is that there that you create like an ongoing narrative on board either with yourself um you can talk to yourself that's totally acceptable in sailing um <laughs> or if you're lucky enough to have a crew then you can talk to them um, so lucky <laughs> yeah, so lucky right so yeah you basically want to identify your predictions for that day like what you think is going to happen and then you want to continue observing whether or not that did happen and it allows you to um you learn throughout the day get more as you get more familiarized with the race course characteristics you know what's happening with the weather um, but it's also just a way to use the, the scientific method, you know, you make a hypothesis, you test it on that leg or during that race, and then you learn from whether what you thought happened or didn't happen. Um, and, the, you know, there are days we've all had them when you're like, I don't really have a good handle on what's happening today. You know, it's just tricky and seems a bit random. And, and this just helps you keep like, keep learning, keep progressing forward and keep honing your skills and calibrating throughout the day. So a few questions we ask each other on board a lot, and this should just be like a, a running dialogue in your head. Um, what place are we in? Are we lifted? Are we headed? Do we have clear air? Are we in the max pressure? Does anyone else have more pressure than us? Are we going fast? Um, it also, you know, you should reflect on, are we focusing on the right thing right now, the most important variable? You know, are we sailing a course or are we sailing the fleet? Um, Steph and I had a great chat earlier when we were putting 
this presentation together about the differences between the first beat and the second beat, you know, and we were talking about how the first beat is much more strategy based and you are trying to sail against more, you know, everyone's closer together, you're trying to sail against them. But the second beat is a lot more tactics based, you're trying to stay in front of who you're in front of or pass a few more boats. And so um, that would be an idea of like, what's the most important variable right now, the wind or the fleet. Um, and then maintaining a dialogue, like I'm in charge of the compass information on board. So just making sure that I'm consistent with how I'm saying it, how frequently I'm saying it, the feedback I'm giving and what the next steps are. Um, and I also like to point out to the crews, um, okay, on our, well, I should say for the non-tacticians, because on our boat, Steph is a skipper and she's a tactician. I'm the crew and I give supporting and supporting information. And there's a lot of ways that the, you can ask prompting questions that are framed in a supportive way that sort of try to helpfully nudge the skipper's focus onto the right thing. And uh, this tactical intelligence, I think, is is really um, a big part of that. You know, for example, like if we're on a ley line and a winter mark's coming up, I'm not gonna spew compass numbers to Steph and take her focus off the, the mark rounding, right? Like at that point, the most important thing is what kind of rounding? What happened that last leg? What place are we in? How much risk are we trying to take? You know, so you, you filter the information based on what's most relevant and most important at that time. Um, Steph, did I cover that? Any other, anything to add? Yeah, I was just thinking like Maggie, super crew in the house. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. How lucky am I? <laughs> we should keep doing these. You keep, you keep thinking that. <laughs> All right. So just kind of, um, you know, for those of you who were with us a couple weeks ago talking about um, wind strategy, we, we talked about how we really like to keep things simple on our boat um, and just kind of going from what Maggie just said and breaking it down even a level further, like if we can focus on these five things on the race course and then we're, we're probably in good shape. So, you know, keeping the boat fast at all times, tactics become a lot harder if you're not faster on the race course. So that's definitely number one priority. Um, and then making sure you're max pressure on the race course um, and on the lifted tack. And I think, you know, this is super relevant for lake racing where you're constantly in different pressure and different, um, and different shifts. So definitely making sure that's a focus. Um, and then, you know, really having a reason to do whatever maneuver you're doing when you tack or jive, like, do I really have a reason to do this right now? Um, and you can really, that, that checklist, um, the tactical intelligence that Maggie was just talking about really helps you answer these questions. Um, you know, there's times when I'll say like, okay, we're lifted. I think we're in max pressure. Um, boat feels really good. No reason to tack. And we just keep going and just keep focusing on, on the, on making the boat go fast. Um, and then, yeah, keeping it, keeping it simple. We're, we're big fans of that. <laughs> Um, so the first first thing we're going to talk about kind of getting more into um, our tactics and strategy of the upwind is ladder rungs and we have these handy dandy diagrams from salesing right um, so thank you very much guys for helping us out with these um, but ley lines are basically set a set of perpendicular lines to the wind um, it helps you visualize who's ahead and who's behind you and um, you know who you're racing and that's an important topic that we'll get into in a little bit um, but it, it just helps you really visualize this and, and it being important, being accurate with this information is a very powerful tool on the race course because it helps you understand which tactical opportunities exist for your, for your team, like consolidation or cashing in on, on a shift. Um, but it also helps with lane management too. So, you know, the difference of half a ladder rung is huge. So, you know, right now we can see that blue and red are on the same ladder rungs and are equal, um, equally up the course, whereas blue, or sorry, green and, and yellow are in the same ladder rung. Um, blue and red are clearly ahead of green and yellow. But if the wind were to shift a little bit one way, the, inter the, the crossing between red and blue would change a lot. So I would say right now, if we were red, I would say right now that blue does not have a strong, a strong lee bow on us. Um, just because if we come back even, they tack, we'll likely um, roll them. Whereas if we shift just five degrees, just a couple degrees to the left, and then we come back, they have, they're have they in a stronger position to leave out us. Um, so that's something to think about with, with lane management, is really being able to visualize these ladder rungs. Um, and, you know, something that we do is on our boat is we actually reference um, positioning in the jib. Um, the ability to see the crew or, um, you know, the, the boat positioning fore and aft in the jib is a really helpful tool for us. Um, 
and I've, I've actually never um, visualized it like like Al and Salesing has on the right here with the the ladder rung line coming off 45 degrees to the perpendicular line of the boat. I thought that was really cool and a nice um, more like scientific way to look at it. Whereas you know we kind of have more of just a feel for the ladder rungs and um, you know no matter how you do it, it's just really important that you have a good sense for this. Yeah, I really like Al's um, diagram too because I think sometimes it is hard on board to visualize like where the ladder rungs have moved based on the shifts. But um, I'd just like to add to that that it, this seems like a simple concept, but knowing who you're racing and who you're close to and who you're clearly behind and who you're clearly in front um, is really important. And it can either make tactical moves appear more easily or not, you know, or misjudging those ladder rungs can can cause you to like think you're covering a pack or think you're you're sailing against these boats that you're not and basically make a tactical error. Um, and, and that's where we find a lot of our like judgment errors come from. It's just um, an, a, like a bad estimation of who we were in front of or behind or we lose track of people because we aren't aware of the, the, the fact that they're creeping up on our ley line. Um, and so sometimes we'll watch trackers after the race and a step it's, it like kills both of us when we're like, how do we not see that pack of boats go from like last place to right behind us? You know, how do we miss that? Um, but so that it's just really important. And Steph was talking about, okay, are you going to be bowed about when you to hypothetically meet, you know, and you might not actually hypothetically meet, but that skill in itself is really difficult. I, I found like we in practice will guess, we'll take every chance we can sometimes when we're splitting with boats to guess where we'd meet. Would that be bad about? Would that be hitting their mast? Would they have a cross on us? Would we cross by one? Like, you know, and that's a skill that you can only get better at by saying what you think and then testing and then calibrating and testing, calibrate and test, calibrate and keep track. So anyhow, um, I stress that a lot, but um, I do wanna also make two more quick points about this. When we're racing, I'll try to say really um, concisely, like we are racing Norway, Denmark, and Germany. That's it, you know, like we, these guys are behind us, like defense on these guys, offense on these guys, you know, and, and identifying either by sail number or by name, maybe, cause I know you guys all know each other um, or country, just saying out loud who you're racing, also allows you to use those boats as benchmarks. Um, so oftentimes we'll run the lure mark and say it's a really shifty, puffy day and we're not totally sure what's happening or you know, t figuring out what the phases are doing takes a lot of energy. On that kind of day, Steph will say like, rounding even with Singapore. You know, so say we split gates and we're rounding even with another boat. Okay, then we know we're going in different directions, but when we come back together, that's a piece of information. Who gained, who lost, which way did they go? And so you can really use the boats as benchmarks and indicators of what's happening all over the course, but in order to do so, you have to be really attuned with who you're sailing and what's happening with the ladder rungs. I want to talk, I, this is probably a review for most of you guys, but it's, I know it's been, been a little while. So, um, but you can position yourself either inside or outside, sort of to windward or to leeward um, of other boats to capitalize on shifts, right? And so in this diagram, we're talking about a header. Both boats get headed. They're sailing up wind on starboard. The breeze goes a little bit to the left, you know, 30 degrees to the left. And between the difference in position from A1 and A2 and B1 and B2 um, shows that the outside boat gained on the header. So in position one, boat B was maybe quarter boat length in front of boat A, and then the wind went 30 degrees left, so toward boat B, B's on the outside, now B is like a full length in front of boat A, um, if you measure from the bows. So that's just a little example of that, and I wanted to show you guys on our tracker, it's much, um, much more subtle, much subtler, not sure, uh, <laughs> in, on the tracker when it happens. But if you guys could just take a look at um, the yellow boat, we would consider outside. Now, I'm not sure if, does that zoom on your screen? Yeah. Okay. So on the outside, we've got Germany, and right now their ranking uh, is fourth. I think they've already hopped in front of the other two boats. But Canada and, the De Canada and Denmark is the light blue and the light purple boat. Those are both inside on this header. Um, and so as this video goes on, I just want you to keep an eye on like their positioning relative to each other. Um, and you'll see that if you could read the numbers, I'm not sure you can, but Canada, most inside on this lift has now lost a lot and is down to like 12th in the rankings. Um, and Denmark so far is losing uh, distance and has dropped in the rankings as well. But um, you can see that their, their angles are coming down a little bit and now, now yellow is starting to get that header too. And so the yellow boat is what we'd call outside on that lift because they're to leeward on, on the outside of it and they are gaining. And now I want to talk about the opposite situation on the lifts. So gaining inside on the lifts. Um, same situation, A and B are going upwind, but this time 
both, you know, the breeze shifts 30 degrees to the right. So it goes, they're both lifted up on the same board. And now A, who was a boat length behind B's bow line is now only a quarter boat length behind B's bow line. This is just a brutal one for us to relive. Steph, you, you weren't on board for this race. Don't worry. No, no. <laughs> no I don't remember this one. <laughs> yeah, that didn't happen. Okay. We are USA 50. We're like the dark blue boat. And the, you can ignore the yellow and orange boats, but we're not talking about them. They're way ahead. We're looking at USA 50, the blue boat, and then the two boats on our hip, Argentina, which is green, and Denmark, which is light blue. So this day was like, this was basically a geographical feature, top left. It just kept paying and kept paying. And so what you're going to look for, I'm going to zoom forward a little bit, is the boats to start winding up inside of us. And at one point, we were ahead of them. And uh, spoiler alert, now they're in fourth and third and we're in sixth, right? So they wound up inside of us and we just lost distance and lost distance and lost ranking on them. The moral of the story here is maybe that we, what, do the same thing against us? Moral of the story. <laughs> <laughs> moral of the story is you gain inside on the lift. So if any boats are leveraged inside of you and it's going to lift, get up to them. Now we know. <laughs> I'm kidding. The tracker can be so mean. Well, and, and speaking of, of gains and losses, I wanted to just touch base about, um, you know, assessing gains and losses in, in boat speed, but also um, in positioning. So talking, you know, one way we talk about it is, um, is, your, is your relatives to another boat. So let's say we're sailing along on port um, and we're to leeward of, of a, one or two boats um, and we'll keep, a, I'll keep my eyes on them and we'll say, okay, we've been, We've been higher, higher, slower overall. And so that tells Maggie, who's managing the speed on our boat, um, you know, a little bit of information about how her setup is with, this, with the mainsail or how the trimming is. Um, but then we have to add in the additional piece of information of whether that's a VMG gain or VMG loss. So if we've been higher and slower, but the boats to windward of us have, have gained forward a lot, that's probably a VMG loss. Um, whereas if you're, you're higher and slower and you feel like you're making more progress up the race course um then it would be a vmg gain um and you can it's just kind of it's it's good to keep keep tabs on the boats around you of, of how your mode is um low and fast high and slow obviously you want to be higher and faster all the time but um you know that's a little bit hard to do all the time so that's the goal but often you're either higher slower or lower faster and so that will That'll help you understand a little bit more about your boat speed setup. And as we talked about earlier, being really faster on the race course is, is super important. So um, just kind of bringing some attention to that um, on the boat this summer, I think will be really cool. Um, and then also it's, it's important to visualize um, your references for your gains and losses. Like Maggie said, around the gates, we'll often reference who, are race, who we rounded with so we can understand who you know, if we've gained or lost when we come back together, but there's also different ways to do it. Um, like looking at a crew positioning on board, for example, and, and just like with the ladder rungs, you're going to have to do a little bit of trial and error with this. Like we've trained a ton to understand where the positioning is so that when we, so that when we see a crew on another boat, I know that we have a tack and cross, um, or, you know, an opposite tacks, we can, from really far edges of the race course, we can watch the other packs, watch the other packs that we're racing, and we can see whether we're gaining or losing trees on on the side, on the side that we're viewing them from. So it's really cool to use some of these tools um, to understand, you know, if you're if you have a boat speed problem or if you're gaining or losing um, from shifts. Steph, trivia question: Making oh. trees. Making trees. <laughs> It's such a big Western term. What does it mean? <laughs> yeah, so I, that um, that would that would be a good thing if we're making trees. Um, we're gaining. That means we can, as we're coming across, we can see more and more trees um, in front of the the boats on the opposite tack. Um, you can use this upwind and downwind. Love it, love it. Okay, and I just have a couple notes to add about communication. Um, so with the boat speed relatives, like when you're saying high and slow, low and fast, higher, faster, whatever it might be, on our boat, we have a rule that we only ever talk about us because we are so self-centered and no, I'm kidding. <laughs> like the, the, I'm kidding. The adjectives we use are only ever in reference to us. So I wouldn't say 
we are going slower than that boat and faster than that boat. You know, like if you're talking about your comparison to one other boat and the, the, the descriptive adjectives are in reference to what's happening on our boat, right? So um, that's, yeah, that, I think that's always really helpful to identify who are we talking about. Um, and then just a couple other quick communication tips, like when the conversation on board is, oh, are we on ley line or are we crossing that boat or um, do we have a leave out? Um, it, just remember that it's, first of all, uh, we like to eliminate the word or the phrase, I think, you know, because you either, you know, know or, you know what I mean? It, you know, it's, it's not, well, I think that we might be maybe crossing, you know, that's not helpful. You either know and it's a yes or a no, or you don't know and it's marginal or I don't know, you have to look. Um, so instead of, ah, I think maybe, you know, that's not a helpful piece of information, but saying yes or no or it's marginal, or I can't see, you have to look. Like, those are all helpful pieces of information as opposed to, I'm not sure, that's confusing. Steph doesn't know if I'm not sure because I can't see, or if I'm not sure because it's close, or I'm not sure because I don't have, I can't look away, or, you know, I'm not sure, doesn't tell her anything. Um, and sometimes we'll say your eyes or my eyes, you know, um, especially if we're looking to match attack. Say we want to match attack with the boat behind us, and I'm really focused on speed, it's right after the Lord Mark, and my heart's 200 beats a minute, you know. Steph will be like, my eyes, you know, she's, she's driving and she's keeping an eye on them. And I know then she's got them. Whereas like, maybe our lane is really precarious and we're trying to wait for something to happen to tack and, and I'll, and I, it's in my vision field. I'll say, I got eyes on it. Um, for the most part though, I don't really have to tell you when I'm looking around because you know, from, from the driving, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, eyes on those telltales. <laughs> um, totally. Okay. So we just went through some like basic concepts of tactics and now we want to walk through a race chronologically starting with the start and talk about tactical opportunities um, as they present themselves on the race course, predominantly on the first beat. But let's start with the start stuff. Yeah, so again, just keeping it really simple. If you, let, if you wanna go to the left and you wanna go straight, you don't wanna start tight on the hip of another boat. It's obviously best to be bow out on a group and able to go fast. Um, so having a nice fat lane to lure it is really important. Um, you could probably go through, this is like, this drone shot is right after a start. So you could probably go through and identify who has good lanes and will be able to hold it, hold all the way, you know, to the left or how long they'll want to hold, how long they can hold to the left. Um, so I think that's a really cool shot. Um, and then, you know, if you want to go right, you have to think about, you know, if where I start, will I have to duck any boats to get there? Um, or can I just snug up, like if, uh, right on the start, if we just snug up more to the boats to windward of us, I can work up on them and then, you know, clear them off my hips so that I can go with them. Um, and obviously on a really shifty day, it's, it's most important to get in phase right away. And so let's say you've gone through the starting sequence and, you know, at like 30 seconds to go, you get hit with a pretty big left shift and you say, okay, I have to get on the port as soon as I can after the start. And so making sure that you position yourself so that the boat to windward of you will have a hard time living um, and then you can flick them off your hip right away. Um, one thing to note about that, um, actually we'll go next slide here, Maggie. Okay, can I make one more note on this slide? Yeah, yeah go for it. Um, I think also where you start in a pack, it comes into play when there's a really extreme line bias, but you don't necessarily wanna go that way. So say it's like massively pin favored, but you wanna go right. Um, sometimes stuff I'll hear you say, let's take the bias. So let's start like pin third, but maybe to windward of that pack, you know, so that we're able to go back to the right earlier or vice versa. Um, but that's, yeah, I, I think that's something I, I think that's something I hear you say. Cool. Yeah. And then, um, just kind of looking at two different scenarios here. Um, obviously situation one, the blue boat, um, is bow back on the red boat and we'll have a hard time living there for a while. Um, Red boats, obviously, are really, they're really happy with their positioning right now and would probably do all they can to, to roll this boat and get over the top of them. And the options for the blue boat are really only to, to duck and tack. And so this is a really important skill to have um, for bailing out after a bad start. And it's something that we practice. Um, we do practice. Obviously, we hope that we don't have bad starts, but <laughs> sometimes it happens. And being able to, to gauge this really well is really important. Um, so, you know, 
obviously don't hold on to bad lanes um, any longer than you have to. If you're, if you're going slow and the rest of the fleet is going fast, you're just going to keep losing and losing. So um, this dip in, this dip in tack is a really important skill. Um, and being able to assess how much you have to sail away in order to complete your tack and then duck um, is a really huge part of this. And obviously if it's windy, you might want to ease your controls um, before you tack or, you know, for our bow, we have to make sure I have the jib sheet in my hand and the controls are maybe a little eased um, so that when we tack, we can duck quite easily. Um, and then just looking at situation two, um, on the right, the blue boat starts quite tight on the hip of this red boat. And as soon as you find yourself in that bow back position or tight on the hip, you have to start looking for, for ways out. Um, but I think the most important thing to note is that you want to be able to tack onto port in either of these situations and sail for a while. The worst is when you get onto port and then you realize like, oh, I have to, I have to tack back because I have an, another poor starter. So making sure you're, before you do execute these maneuvers that you take a look over your shoulder um, and assess like, okay, there's actually another boat who had a, a bad start and I need, I need to either, I'll need to duck them or tack and I, I might wait for them to tack so I can have a better lane on port. Um, is something you might consider. And so couple, just one other thing to look out there too is boats ducking you to leeward. Um, if people further down the line also had a bad tack and, or bad start, they're bailing out. Um, just remember that while you're tacking, you can't force, I mean, you can't cause them to avoid you while you're tacking, right? You have to um, at least, you know, let them duck you and then tack. Um, so not only looking at boats over your shoulder and on your windward hip, but also boats that are tacking out to leeward is pretty important. Um, and I wanted to add one other point, also a crew communication point. Um, in that moment when you both know it's been a bad start, right? And you're waiting for that moment to tack out. Um, and the skipper's really focused on driving and they'll ask, can we tack, can we tack, can we tack? It's really easy to say, no, we can't tack because they're boats to windward, you know? But if the answer is, the answer shouldn't ever be, no, we can't tack, you know, because you can dip and tack, right? So we try to work that into our communication that if we had someone on our hip, it was, okay, can I tack? It'll be a, dip, a duck and tack. It'll be a dip and tack, you know, whatever it might be. But just acknowledging that option as opposed to saying no <laughs> helps you not sail forward for as long. And, and also, um, we realize that if we're saying, are they, are they hurting us? Are we going slow? You probably already have been going slow and it's already time to tack five minutes ago. So don't get to that point, you know. Um, we've learned so much from looking at the tracker in this exact moment because it's so easy to like get blinders at this point in the race and like only see the boat to windward and the boat to leeward of you and be fighting, fighting, fighting. But if you look at the tracker, often those packs, the boats that are really close and everyone's jockeying for a lane, they're going like half a knot to a full knot slower than the other boats that are able to put their bow down. And you lose so much distance and you're so caught up in this like tiny little pack that you're racing. So just remember that um, if you're pinching, you, it's not a sustainable mode. You can't do it for very long, but we'll get into more of that later. We have a question here from Jeff. Um, when you tack out, do you have concern about having excessive separation from the leaders? How far do you go, especially if you tacked away from the lifted tack? That's a really good question, Jeff. That's a good question. I would say um, if, you, if you've tacked away from the lifted tack, um, definitely try to get back on the lifted tack as soon as possible. Um, and we'll touch base on this in a little bit, but you know, sometimes you actually do need to sail in bad air on the lift attack. If you're in the most pressure on the race course and you're on the lift attack, but you're, you have to compromise a little bit of a clean lane, that can sometimes be better than um, doing those two tacks um, and just staying in phase. So, um, you know, that's always an option. It's not necessarily a pretty one and it definitely doesn't feel good on the helm, um, but it's definitely an option. Um, Maggie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I was gonna add that, um... Jeff, I think it also goes back to your pre-start homework and what kind of day you identified it is. Um, if it's really important and you felt strongly about getting to one side or another, you know, so say it's a must go left kind of day and you get flushed off the starting line, then I think it's helpful to say on board, this is a clearing tech, you know, and we're trying to go back as quickly as possible. So the first doable lane that we have back on starboard, we take. Um, whereas on a day that you're not really sure what's happening or it seems like an open race course or there's not obviously pressure on one side or other, then tack and focus on speed and heads up for another indicator to tack. 
Well, you know, and I think that just get, if Steph is like, we have to go left, we have to go left. That'll be in the back of my mind. If that lane isn't going well and I'll, and you just, as the crew, sometimes the skipper gets really focused on driving on when, once we've tacked on a port and it helps to just ask like, was this a clearing tack? Is this still a clearing tack? Um, and just identify how many boats are taking your hip. But yeah, I think it, it kind of goes back to what you decided before the start. How badly do you need to get to that side versus like, can you sail on port for a little while, get free and clear and then tack back? Yeah. Um, and, then, and then he also asked about, do you have concern about having excessive separation from the leaders? Um, and I think like, just kind of, you know, if you tack out and you realize like you're kind of the only one going that way, like definitely play with the numbers a bit more, especially like if you don't, if it's an open race course and you don't really know which, which side is favored or, you know, it's a really stable day, like we would say, you know, stay, stay with the numbers. So if, if we've tacked off and then all of a sudden we're like, oh, actually like a lot of the fleet is with us right now, then we'll maybe keep going if we don't know what's going on. But if, if, if not, then we would tack back and just say like, let's, let's stick with the numbers here. Yeah, totally. I think actually we're going to get to your question in a few slides when you talk about getting separation and whether that's a good thing or bad thing. So um, hang tight on that one. Um, we just talked a lot about lane management, but Steph, I think, yeah, I just touched on this a little more. Yeah, I think, you know, lane management is a really important part of, of race of the race course. Um, if you have a fat lane, you have the freedom to do what you want with your moting, um, you know, you have no stress to keep the boat going fast. Um, this is especially critical in light air and when you're on the long tack. Um, in, for those of you who are with us for our first webinar, we shared our pre-start um, reminders and this is definitely one of them. You have to have fat lanes on the long tack and especially in light air. Um, and we, we have it for upwind and downwind. So a big fat lane would mean no one directly to lure of you and no one bowed out of you. Basically no one giving any stress as you sail up the course. Um, and obviously this is, this is a bit of a dream to have it all the time. Um, sometimes you have to work with, like with a thin lane, like off the starting line. Um, and just remembering that you don't have to hold on to a bad lane. Um, if you're going slow, um, you know, and the rest of the fleet is going fast, it's, it's not going to be good for the long term. So like Maggie said, be okay with getting out of there nice and early. Um, yeah, I almost want to reiterate here because how long you suffer in a bad lane should be related to the type of day it is and like how badly you need to get to where you're headed. You know, like if it's a must, must go left, then you'd rather suffer for 10 more boat lengths and stay in that lane. Um, or say it's a day that tax are really costly and you're close to ley line and you're like, okay, we can just suffer and go a little slow for 10 boat lengths instead of tacking twice to get to this ley line. So I think what kind of day it is really determines like how much you can tolerate um, and how badly you need those fast. Because if it's a speed day, your lane is everything. You know, like how good your lanes were, how clear your air was and how fast you could go determined everything. And so then the two tacks to clear your breeze early on were totally worth it. Um, and I also want to zoom in on, I think this is another stolen diagram from uh, Salesing. Did that zoom on your screen? Yeah, okay. Yep. Um, I, I, we really like this one. I haven't seen it drawn this way before because I like how much the backwind zone, it shows you, okay, you're, maybe you're not necessarily, you're not getting covered in that backwind zone when you're on someone's windward hip, um, but you are getting uh, bad air in a sense, and it's hard to sail fast when you're on someone's hip, right? So you're not getting like covered in the normal sense of that blanket zone, but you are getting bad um, backwash and uh it, it, you're you're getting affected even with their bow out and to lured so i dug that yeah and just and one more comment for off the starting line um i remember when we were racing in genoa italy last spring um it was a really light air regatta so fat lanes are really important um and coming off the line or the right side of the course was mainly favored so we would start near the boat and then obviously want to get towards the right as quickly as we could but and so we'd start we try to work the boat off our hip but that the timing of your tack on if you if you work the boat on your hip off on the port, your, the timing of your tack on the port is really really critical for that for that um, long board or getting toward that favorite side. So let's say they're actually um, more like maybe their bow is mid boat um, and they when they go to tack you can't match because then you'll be in the same position on the other tack. So. If they're if they're in a relatively strong position on you on starboard, when you when they tack off, give yourself a couple seconds 
sorry, doing <laughs> sailing karate in the <laughs> webcam here. When they go to tack off, make sure you give yourself a couple seconds so that you can have that fat lane on the on the tack that you want to be on for a while. Sweet. Um, okay, so now that we've talked about the kind of lanes we want, I want to talk about ways you can use your speed to make those better or to make them work. Um, so there are three basic modes. Uh, VMG, which velocity made good, just to review that it would be like your target speed for the day, target speed, target angle, best optimum speed and angle for your boat in those conditions. Um, we had a great quote from John Bertrand one day when we were when we were like, well, then we were in high mode and we were in low mode and we were in high mode, and we were in low mode for this reason. And he was like, it's really hard to beat VMG, you know, and that was a great reminder. It was like, just, just sail the boat normal and sail the boat fast. VMG is usually the right answer. Um, but there are also times when, like Steph said, if you really want to go one way and you have to make that lane work, okay, well, let's go into a high mode. Let's make a little gap to windward so that we can sail normal. Um, and on our boat, we th I think about this with the sail setup as um, using, making a fuller sail for pointing uh, and I want a straighter leech. So on our boat with the controls, that would be easing the Cunningham, you know, or not pulling as much Cunningham on. Um, Cunningham on our boat twists off the top of the leech. And so I would want a straighter leech, less twisty um, and a fuller sail that's gonna help us point and maybe ease the vang. But both of those are also not long-term adjustments. You know, I'm saying artificially ease the vang and Cunningham from the right optimum setup for the breeze just to give you a little cheater height for a minute. So I'm not sure on your boat exactly what that is, but just think about pointing fuller sail, straighter leech versus a low mode would be um, when we want to put the bow down and rip, we want a flatter sail with more twist, especially if we're overpowered, then we exaggerate that. Like to the point where if we're extremely overpowered or, or overstood, which feels like we're overpowered because we're tight reaching down to the mark, we will like ease vang maybe even put Cunningham back on. But anyhow, you're going for twisty sail then. You want a twisty fast forward mode. Um, so if you're over, overpowered on your boat, I think that would be cutting, uh, dro dropping traveler. Um, and make sure also if you have jibs that for that bow down mode, you're, you're cracking off the jib as well. You need to know that when you start getting looser on the main sheet and twistier on the main, um, but ba basically looser on the main sheet, that slot between the main and jib becomes smaller. So. I can't, as a as the main sheet trimmer, just start reeling out the main sheet and not ask Steph, the jib sheet trimmer, if she's cracked off or not. You know, I can't ease that main sheet to that end range until I know that Steph is also cracked off on the jib. Um, on our boat also, it's really helpful to take a step back, get the bow up when we're trying to go in that low mode and plane and go fast forward. Um, but I'm not sure about yours. And the boat has to be either super flat or a little boat to little heel to windward for the bow down mode. But again, these are extreme. That's an extreme mode where we'd head down like three or five degrees and we would intentionally move forward on a boat or a pack and then we'd go back to normal. Um, but anyhow, those, those modes have to be announced and we both have, and have to be coordinated and we have to be on the same page. So it's usually, it should be the tactician's call if you're gonna go to an extreme moding um, for a tactical reason, it's the tactician's call, but sometimes the trimmer has to initiate it. So Steph has to be wanting to go bow down and, and mention that and go fast forward. And then I've got to like, ease me and go for windward heel and tell her I'm doing that. Um, okay, cool. So other times that you might use a low mode is like, um, actually this is on the next page. Wait, 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 real quick, does, um, does anyone have any comments on any like scout specific tips for, for different moding styles? I know our, our 49ers a little bit different than the scout. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I think what Steph's getting at is like you need to know how much faster you actually are going in your low mode. On our boat, it can be like two knots faster if it's if it's really exaggerated. I mean, and that's an exaggeration. It's probably not faster, but um, because we're a planing boat uh, and an apparent wind boat, that that makes a pretty big difference. But yeah, just you have to just experiment and know: am I going lower and significantly faster, or am I just going lower and the same and losing the energy, losing gains? Any questions? Or are we good on that one? Um. Okay, so tactical moding. Um, real quick, we have a we have a question from Al Hager. He said, "Do you use the Wally technique?" Which I didn't know what that was, but um, foot on a lift and pinch on a header. Um, we're actually going to get to that in a little bit. So, really good question and good point. Um, that's been that was a hot topic of this um, of putting together this presentation. But I didn't know it was the Wally technique. You'll have to explain to me why <laughs> why it's called that. Yeah, I didn't know that either. I like it. Um, Okay, so basically tactical moding, like Al said, would be um, if you get a lift, 
cracking off and going bow down and fast forward um, to basically make the most of that shift. You're trying to capitalize and, and make the most gains out of it. So you get that bow down fast forward mode without actually having to go down and losing any height. Um, and, and that can be really advantageous when you're trying to move forward on a pack of boats. So for example, in this photo, it might be hard to see the country flags, but Spain, who's on the um, far left, left side, yeah. the most windward boat in the frame, um, if a lift was to come, she should put her bow down and try to get as bow even and bow forward on those packs, you know, try to roll if possible, but that'll be pretty hard from where she is. Um, but she's trying to get as far, far bow forward as possible so that when it does go back the other way, she's not falling down into her hip, into their hip. Um, and it just puts you in a more controlling position on that pack. And then the opposite of that would be if you start getting headed, go into a height mode, um, as long as it makes sense to do so. You can't also slow down in it, then you're just making it a double whammy. But um, if you're getting headed and you can go into that height mode temporarily, you wanna do that to keep the lateral separation from the boats around you and minimize your loss there for when it does come back. Um, and so this can also be a way to manage like, and Steph's gonna chat about this in a second, but um, where you are relative to a pack of boats and if you're trying to cover them or keep them, you know, keep control on them, seeing those opportunities uh, to, to shift your, ta your moding for these tactical opportunities and, and to change gears a little bit, like switching gears between those modes throughout the day really helps. Does I that think this photo is really interesting because, you know, looking at it, you, you see one boat obviously sailing in really bad air. Um, so they must be liking something on the left hand side or they're just, I, I don't know what they're doing. Um, but then, you know, it's Germany who's the second boat from the left is also in a pretty tough lane there. And they're, they're trying to, to hold on to that as well. And, you know, if, if, if I were Germany, I, I would be thinking, okay, we're in a pretty tough position here because you obviously have that thin lane to leeward, And then you have um, Spain on your hip, who's basically bow even, if not like a little bit bow forward. And they're, they're a roll threat there. So like Maggie was saying, Spain's probably looking to put the bow down um, to get a little bit stronger on these guys. Um, whereas Germany is going to have a tough time fighting them off on their hip. And um, I, I, I think that all the tactical moding is, is really cool. And there's just so many different ways to use it. It's a really powerful tool. Also, another thing that Germany should be thinking here is they're like the freest to tack. Well, besides from Spain. Um, but the other three boats in that, in the bottom pack are kind of stuck. Um, the boat that's just in terrible breeze should tack at any point, but. They should do the dip and tack. You should dip and tack, yeah, exactly. Um, so you could dip and tack, but then Germany could also match them because of how much separation they have to win. Or Germany and Spain could match the, the one to lure. So um, if I was Germany, we'd be thinking, okay, let's let this, like, if, if we can keep going fast and they can slow down, then when they do slow down, then we tack. Um, so yeah, I dig that picture too. Okay, um, now Steph, you wanna chat about leverage, which. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so. There's two ways to pass boats, um, leverage or insane boat speed. Um, leverage is usually the most common way. And basically leverage is, you know, if you're in the middle of the race course, you have no leverage. Um, if you're on the, the edge of the race course, you have a lot of leverage. Um, leverage can be, can be good and bad. Um, you can have good leverage where you're leading to the next shift. And when it shifts, you know, when you get a bit of a header, you can, tack and what we say is cash it in. Um, but you can also take too much leverage, which can be really high risk. Um, so in general, if you want a less risky approach, you would have less, less leverage. Um, you know, example, in a, if you're having a good race, um, you wouldn't want to take a lot of leverage on the fleet. Um, you'd want to keep the fleet in your zones um, and keep them in your control, which we were just touching base on in that last slide. Um, you know, if you're having a tough race, obviously going for a little bit of leverage or a lot of leverage could, could help you make some big gains. But, you know, with that also comes a, comes a high potential of making big losses. So you kind of get into a little bit of a deeper discussion with that of like, where are we with our overall scores? And this goes back to the tactical intelligence that we were talking about in the beginning. It's okay. If, if we've, sailed our throw out race already, we can't take a high risk here because we can't risk losing anything more than we already have, the position that we already have. Um, so I think, you know, really managing that risk versus reward on the, on the leverage is important. 
Um, and then consolidation is, is when you use your leverage to make a gain on the pack. Um, and again, this you need to be really good at, at gauging um, if you can tack and cross and the timing of this is absolutely critical. There's, there's nothing worse than like when you, when you go to tack and cross a group and you actually don't make that cross, it's like, that's the worst thing. So being able to really gauge that is, is important and um, making sure everyone on your boat is on the same page that you're, you're setting up for attack and standing by um, the time is critical. And um, a really important part of, of this consolidation and crossing a pack that you have leverage on is, um, is watching the boats on your hip. Um, so if you're sailing along and um, you know, you, you're kind of watching for that, the moating and placement that we were talking about before, as soon as you see them, boats on your hips starting to come bow down, that's when your opportunity starts to become golden. And um, you, know, you know when that moment's coming, and I'll say to Maggie, like, you know, as soon as these guys go bow down, we're, we're getting ready for attack. And so she, in her eyes, she's like, all right, I know we have to, I'm, I'm ready whenever Steph says 2-1. And um, I think that's a really important part of the communication. Um, and then the final step of the consolidation is when you, when you do tack and cross is that you tack back at a place where the, the pack that you're racing is in your zone. And on the right hand side here, we have um, an example of what we would call a zone. So if you're the yellow boat, um, I kind of visualize it as like a line going off our bow and then a line going off our stern. Anyone in that, um, in that area is in our zone. Um, and you can kind of, you know, use this to your advantage too. If, hold on, go back, Maggie. This is, there's your zone picture. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Sorry. Um, yeah, so you can use that to your advantage too if you're looking to cash in on leverage. Like, okay, I'm 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 inside someone's zone. Okay, now with this header, I've had more speed. I'm outside their zone. Okay, this is they've come bow down. I have an opportunity to attack and cross. So um, that's how I like to think about it. Is is the zone concept? And yeah, and also just to elaborate on that. Um, so if you look at this picture, um, the pink boat who's leading, like the on the far right side with the leader line. Uh, right off her bow. So she's in a really strong covering position right now because the boats that are nearest her directly behind her are basically like on her center line or just above. And then the boats to lure that are also nearest to her are in that zone that Steph was describing. And so that her zone cover looks really good. In contrast, if we go down to like the red boat, um, I think it's, yes, the only red boat on the on starboard on the screen. Let's see if I can show you. I don't know cursor, sorry, but um, the red boat that's got on starboard with purple to lured, they really only have like one boat in their zone. So the, the two purple and the orange that are on the top left, they're outside of red zone, right? Because they're advanced bow forward on them. And the boat, there's a huge pack inside to the middle. So we just wanted to contrast those two positions. Like the leader of this race is doing a really good job covering the boats that are nearest threats. And going back to what we were saying earlier about like knowing who you're racing is important to know who you can let go, like who you can just say, we're, we don't care if they get outside our zone or not. Um, that's a community, that's a conversation we have on board a lot. Like if we were on Pink's boat, Steph would be thinking a lot about driving, you know, like the speed is really critical right here. And I would let her know when the boats that are near us are starting to tack out. And I start saying, okay, we've got a threat getting two threats to our left, two threats getting to our right. And that helps Steph kind of keep tabs on who is getting leveraged on us. How are we getting vulnerable? And like, what risk is she willing to take, you know? Um, okay, cool. So just to backtrack for two quick seconds, um, when we talk about covering, two basic kinds of covering, I brought that uh, bad, bad air slide back again because we like it so much, but the tight cover would be when you tack on someone so that they are directly in your bad air and they're getting negatively affected by your wind uh, in a big way. They are suffering, right? They have to take evasive action. <laughs> Whereas a loose cover, they can keep sailing in that way, you know, and they can keep sailing, but they're in your zone. And so you're, in a sense, you're covering like in a geographical way, you know, you're covering by keeping yourself between them and the mark or maybe above a, one ladder rung above them. Um, but one point we wanted to make about the tight versus loose cover if you tightly cover someone, if you, if you tack and you slam in their face, they're gonna tack almost immediately. So it's not really an intelligent thing to do if you tack onto the header and you force them to tack immediately. Okay, now you're on the header and they're on the lift and that, that didn't accomplish anything, right? So now they're on the lift, you're tacking back on their hip and now you've tacked twice in a short period of time and you're, you, now they're bow out and out of your zone. So just think about you want a loose cover on the lift 
and you'd want to tight cover on the lift. Wait, I said that wrong. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to lose cover on the lift. If you, yeah, if you tight cover someone on the lift, it'll force them to tack out onto the header. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yes. Flashing me back to match racing days, Maggie. <laughs> I know, totally match racing. And I like, don't have it totally straight. But um, if you're going to tight cover someone, anticipate that they're going to tack. So you better be on the lift and you better be forcing them onto the header. Um, whereas a loose cover, uh, you're allowing both boats to keep going. So if you want to get to a ley line, for example, if you're leading, the best thing you can do is get to a ley line and then there's no other options, right? Like the, the race is over. Steph calls that shut down the leg. And so if you want to shut down the leg, you're not going to get anyone to that ley line by like tacking on their face and making them tack back immediately, right? So sometimes we'd say we want them to travel. Like we want to let them travel to that ley line. Okay, go for a loose cover. Don't give them any reason to tack immediately. And then every distance you get closer to that ley line is fewer options that they have. Yeah. Okay, so that's tight versus loose. I think we covered zones pretty well. Um, yeah, and I just, just one more thing on, um, on covering is when in doubt, stay between the gear competition and the mark. It's just, um, I think that's a really simple and simple way to think about it and um, a, a rule of thumb that we default to a lot um, when we're controlling packs and um, crazy conditions. <laughs> cool. Um, so obviously every situation um, where you come together with boats, you have, you know, basically three options, cross, tack, or duck. Um, and it's important that you think about kind of all the tools that we've just talked about, the, the course percentages, um, what shift you're in, um, how your lane is, um, and how your pressure is. So we talked a little bit about um, boats being weak and strong for a lee bow. So anytime we come into a, a crossing situation like this, um, if we're the starboard boat or the port boat, we're talking or thinking about, okay, do we have a strong, strong lee bow um, if we want to go that way? So thinking about, okay, cross tack or duck, do I want to go straight? Which, which side of the race course do I want? If I'm the port tack boat here and I want to continue straight because I know I'm close to the ley line, then I'm going to set up for, for a duck. Um, but if I'm the starboard tack boat in this, in this option, I'm thinking about the course percentage and, and a lane where, so I might make the, the port tack boat, um, tack so that I can take their lane. Or I might think that they're, they're going to duck because they're really close to lay line. They don't want to do any more tacks. So I might have to, to actually tack before them. Um, so I think just really thinking when you come into each of these situations, which side of the course do I want? What is the course percentage? How is my lane? And where is the most amount of pressure? Um, and then for the starboard boat, this is especially important. Are they strong or weak? Um, can they put a strong lee bow in on us or are they weak to put a lee bow on us? And that'll answer your question if they're going to likely duck behind you um, or not. So I think these are just really important, simple, um, ways to think about it. And I think the course percentage is, is really important, especially like in this scenario. Um, but a couple, a couple of little tricks for this too, is if, if you're, um, if you're the port tack boat and you want to, to duck and let's say in this situation, like you have a, a great lane to lure. So a duck is a good option. You're obviously very near ley line. Um, you can do a, what we call a high duck. So you would actually like keep your boat a little bit high so that when you go to duck, so you let these guys advance on you so the duck is a little bit easier. Whereas if you, if you don't do that, you put your bow down really early and it gives the, the starboard tech boat, it, it basically gives away what you're doing. So if you go high and slow, then the boat can either tack to leeward and then you can put the bow down and rip over them, or you go high and slow, let them get advanced and then go for a nice easy duck. Um, and that high duck is really, or that high, high and slow then duck is really helpful when your lane is a bit precarious to begin with. Like say you're ducking a few boats and you're on the hip of a pack, knowing and seeing it unfold earlier, you know, and being able to say, we're going to tack and go high and slow for a second and then go, um, and never actually cracking off and losing any distance to leeward is, is really powerful. In our boat, it takes a lot of coordination, <laughs> you know, to like slow because you have to know how, how much to slow down and then when to reaccelerate. Yeah. You can also do it um, opposite on, on starboard. Let's say, let's say you're the starboard boat here and you're, you know, in the middle of the race course and you need to go left and 
you know, there aren't really any lanes to windward of you. So you would, you might expect that this boat might tack to leeward of you. So one thing you can do is actually just, you know, a couple boat lengths out, put the bow down just a little bit so that when you come back together with them, they're forced to tack a little bit earlier and then you can put the bow up um, and have a nicer lane. Yeah, you can, you can put the bow up and have a nicer lane or you can also keep the bow down and rip over them more easily. Like you almost, someone could maybe leave out you if you were just going normal VMG and then now you crack off and uh, are you really disciplined about going into that fast low mode as they start tacking and then you're more likely to get bow forward on them. Like you just think that we have to get as, as every inch forward as we can while they're still slow because if you let them complete their tack and come up and then we slow down, our chances of rolling them are gone. Yeah. Um, we have a question here from Al Hager. Um, when you say course percentage, do you mean short or long tack? Um, and yeah, essentially, we, we talk in, in percentages, like if we were the port tack boat here, we're 100% on port tack. Whereas, you know, if you're the starboard tack boat, you might say we're 5% on this board and nine and 95% on the other board. Um, so you can, we, we, we back it up, um, up the course. So as you, as you get up the course more, you can say, okay, we're 50, 50. And then you get out to the left side, you're, um, 40, 60, which is the amount of time you say the amount of time you have to sail on the, on the board that you're on. And then, um, the board that you would tack onto. So, as you get closer to the side, you're 40, 60, 30, 70, 20, 80, 10, 90. Um, and that just helps count you into those decision points. Um, and that's a really important part of when you're thinking about this tack cross or duck. Um, another thing I wanted to mention with this um, is kind of like the, the psychology behind it and the communication when you come into a crossing situation. Um, as a starboard tag boat, you never ever want to yell no because that sounds like go or if you say go it could sound like no so you want to be really clear with your communication on this and like if you're coming along and you want that port tack boat to to tack or or duck you would just say starboard and then they know that they have no option of a cross um and then vice versa if you're the port tack boat and you're like oh maybe we have this cross maybe we don't then um, if, if it's a really close one, you can say cross or tack, cross or tack, and then it makes a harder decision for that starboard tack boat. When you when you put it in their mind, like, hey, I might tack and take your lane here, then they're gonna say maybe more likely to say let you cross. Yeah, and and you're contrasting tack or cross, tack or cross instead of can I cross? If yeah. you're asking, can I cross? Can I cross? Can I cross? Can I, can I go? Can I go? It yeah, sounds like please. no. Right. Yeah, and people are like, starboard, I'm still starboard. Um, I would, one thing I want to point out about this cross tack or duck situation that I really liked um, at a U.S. sailing team camp a few years ago, Malcolm Page asked the whole U.S. sailing team camp, several of us, a question and kind of stumped us. And he was like, okay, you're a port tack boat and you see a starboard tack boat coming. What, what are you thinking about? What are you asking yourself? And we were all like, can I cross? Are we not crossing? Can we leave out? Do we not have a leave out? You know, all these questions about where the boats would meet, what our options were. And he was like, no, none of that matters. Like that, that all, that, that all answers itself. You should be asking yourself and your skipper, like, where do we want to go? Are we trying to carry on? Okay. Then we're obviously ducking. Are we trying to protect the left? Then it's going to be a leave out. You know, are we, um, you know, just think about, it. are you look waiting for more pressure? Then we're going to like try to cross and then tack later. But, um, Oftentimes you get, you kind of stutter on this tack, can we, can we tack, can we not cross, can we, and then you end up hesitating too long and then attacking late or ducking late and you lose a lot. Whereas yeah. if you know that you want to carry on, then you can execute the high duck or a low and fast duck or a good leave out. Or if you don't have a leave out, you tack early. Um, no least turning, no least turning. <laughs> no least turning. Yeah, we've all been there, so. Yeah, let's hear it. I, just the common thread in a lot of what you guys have talked about is comes back to communication. And it's just so impressive uh, how you've, you know, been able to put everything together communication wise. Every successful team I've ever been on, communication became second nature to the people on the team. Uh, they just knew what others were thinking. How did, how long did it take you to get to that point and, and what was it? What was it like? I, I really like the simple things like don't say go and no because they 
so easy to mix them up. Uh, but, but it seems like you've really got a, a special language between the two of you. That is a, like a work in progress. You know, that's like that communication goal is just a constant thing that we work on. I think we debrief communication like almost daily, you know? Um, and it's, a, it's, it was a struggle for me at one point because when I get tired or nervous, I tend to talk really fast and mumble or if I'm really tired that I don't talk at all, you know, Steph would have to like keep me, um, she, we kind of have to regulate each other or, or the other side of that would be, I think when Steph, Steph, when you're stressed, you tend to be quieter, you know? And so the two of us have to kind of help regulate each other and keep us in that productive zone. Um, but in order to, to have a productive amount of communication, we really try to keep our words concise. They're almost scripted. Like we will write down, you know, who says what, when, and what it means. Um, and it's, it takes a lot of intentional work about like what you're saying and then what you're letting the other person say. Um, Steph, I don't know if you, what you'd add to that. I, I, yeah. I, I mean, that's what, I, that's immediately what I thought of too, is keeping it clear and concise. And um, it's, we almost have like a playbook um, that we, you know, we, there's certain words that mean, you know, a lot more powerful things. And um, I think one big thing we talked a lot about with Dave Allman was like cutting out like the, like the radio noise, you know, like what is actually the most important thing to say? And Maggie talked about this earlier, you know, if, if we're on ley line, then the most, the most important thing is not the compass because we, you know, we're only trying to go fast here. So really just um, kind of everyone understanding um, what the priorities are on the boat and, and how you can just simplify everything that you're saying. Um, yeah, I think we had a pretty funny situation this summer when we were speed testing um, and we were, Maggie and I were communicating a ton and, and, you know, she has the main sheet, I have the helm. And so we do have to communicate a good bit, but we were over communicating and then we were actually sailing the boat like horribly. And Dave Ullman was like, you guys just, just stop talking. And then we stopped talking. We started sailing the boat. Great. So um, there is, you know, the point of where you can over communicate. Um, but it's, yeah, it's definitely a work in progress. And um, it's, it's a really important part of, you know, having everyone on the same page. And I'd, I'd also add a couple like teamwork oriented rules that we have on our team that, um, have to do with communication one would be that like if something's bothering you or you want to talk some about something you gotta hash it out like you have to say it you know it has to be communicated or you're as much a part of the problem as whatever you were going to talk about <laughs> you know um and that that's just sort of a little rule we have where it's like we're really communication uh heavy um but also uh it's not often what you say but how you say it you know and so like in terms of our internal communication when we do debrief or when we talk about conflict resolution or whatever it might be, it's uh, it's not usually like what you said or that you said something, but how you said it. And so we really try to be intentional about how to have conversations, when to have them. We did get another question here from Rob, uh, and it really kind of relates to another topic that, that had resonated with me as just mental attitude. So keeping your head in the game is so critical. When something goes wrong, what techniques do you use to get past it and energize for the rest of the race. Well, great question. We'd we'd be happy to take that live, Rob, if, if um, you have a follow up for this. Um, one of our mantras is to really focus on the process, and to us that means um, a mentality that is uh, really focused on continually learning. And um, I'll contrast this with two quick stories. One was the, so during our trials, because I think this illustrates it pretty well. During our trials, we had two back-to-back -back world championships and we showed up to the first one and we felt like, okay, we are very confident in our proper preparation. We've done everything we can. We've worked as hard as we could. We spent as many hours on the water as we could. We felt like we turned over every stone. And yet, and so it was time to deliver at our Olympic trials. It was time to produce and deliver and execute. And we went out there just thinking that we should do that. Um, and unfortunately, when things don't go well, which is pretty frequent in any sailboat race, right? We all know that sailboat racing is not about making every single decision correctly and executing every single plan. You know, it's actually about minimizing the mistakes you make and recovering better from them. Um, that, that allows you to persevere over the course of a race and a regatta and several races and so on. So if the objective is to make fewer mistakes and recover from the better and make better choices a higher percent of the time, because no one is perfect and no one can be, 
the, the mentality that I was talking about earlier of execute and produce and deliver really doesn't jive well with that when you do inevitably make a mistake. You know, you don't really know how to reconcile these two thoughts. Like on the one hand, this is the final Olympic trials. We're supposed to be delivering. Oh, how could we have just had a bad start? This is, you know, it's kind of, it turns into a system freak out. Whereas um, we made a conscious effort to approach the second worlds and say, okay, we need to learn from every leg during every, from every race. We need to learn between races. We need to learn after races every day. We were really intentional about having structured debriefs um, using video lessons learned um, and focusing on that process and really leaning into that process helped us keep moving forward. It really, you just think about putting one foot in front of another and then you find that you are actually doing that. Um, and we, we really believe in that. And that's, that's why we say we focus on the process and the process is learning. You know, the journey doesn't end at the trials or end at the Olympics. It's just a long-term journey that we're on for, you know, this is a life. It's, it's, um, <laughs> we're never going to stop campaigning. No, but what I mean is the journey is the end goal, right? And, and actually learning to keep learning is the end goal. And so, um, that's sort of a macro level. And if we take it down and we zoom into the little details of every race, that is, it's talk, it's asking those questions and keep asking those questions. You know, when something's gone really wrong, okay, how are we going to gain boats? We just need to gain boats from here. There's a lot of race left. You know, you can, you have to know how to pick your partner up and pick your team up a little bit. And um, if, if that's what your question was, I mean, sometimes I just throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. So with Steph, I'll tell a stupid joke. And if that doesn't work, I'll, um, you know, sometimes I'll give her a little bit of tough love. And if that doesn't work, then I'll, you know, be really encouraging. And if that doesn't, you know, and you just kind of cycle through it as a crew, you're like, okay, here's my playbook of ways to cheer my teammate up. And that's my job right now. And I'm going to cycle through it. Something works. And it usually does. Um, and, and Steph, I would say also, um, does a great job of being receptive to that. So if the mental, you know, mood gets down on the boat, uh, you need to remember that you have to make a choice to be a good teammate and to, to, allow yourself to be cheered up and allow yourself to come around. And, um, you know, that's, that's important too. You can't just kind of go dark on your team and silent and just not rally at any point. That's, you, you got to make a choice to be a good teammate and really bring it that day. So when things aren't going well, we go back to those processes and we start, if we just had a terrible race, we, we say, okay, what are we going to do differently next time? And uh, we as a team make sure that we have a good handle on what happened the last race and how it's not going to, and how we're going to do better the next race. Um, and then you got to focus on the positive proactive steps. You can't focus on not capsizing. You can't focus on screwing up the start or not messing up or not being over. You know, if you get stuck in those really negative thought spirals, um, the technique we use is to intentionally distract yourself from focusing on the end result or focusing on negative outcomes by focusing on the process and the little baby steps and the, and the micro steps along the way. Just general thoughts, of whether you're the port tech boat or the starboard tech boat coming into the situation. Um, which side of the course do I want? Um, what is the course percentage? Um, how, how is my lane? Um, and where is the most amount of pressure? And then if you're the starboard tech boat and you think they might be able to leave out, thinking if they have a strong or weak leave out. Um, and we're actually gonna kind of just go right into the next slide here because I think this will help us um, understand there's basically two options if you're coming up to a pack, either leading them back or crossing over and going on their hip. Um, and we like to think about leading back um, if you're near ley line. So in, in the previous example, that starboard tack boat might actually choose to tack underneath um, the port tack boat because they were near, very near ley line. Um, or this example, if they're near ley line, I would say if you're 70, 80, or 90% on the course, maybe more like 80%, you would want to start thinking about leading back. Um, or if the pack is already in pressure and on the lifted tack. So you're coming across and maybe starting to get headed and um, these guys already have good pressure and are starting to get lifted, you can lead, you can leave out and then lead them to the next shift. Um, and then here we have an example of edging out, um, can also be called stepping up on the, on the fleet or the pack. Um, it's basically when you hip up on the pack, um, when there's more pressure on that side. Um, you'd use it if you think you're just going to keep getting wound up, um, more lifted on port tack, 
or you think there's going to be more pressure out there, or maybe um, this pack is more in the middle of the course, so you might go towards the edge of them. Um, but I think a really important thing to think about um, when you're executing this move is if I can, can I tack in a position that I'm still controlling them? Just like we talked about earlier is like, if I tack on their hip, are they going to be really bow out on me and having leverage and leading to the next shift? Or can I cross over and tack on them um, with them having very minimal leverage? And one other thing we talk about um, when we're talking about the day in the beginning of, you know, before a race or at the beginning of a day, we talk about like, how, how is the pressure forming and sitting on the water? Sometimes it's really streaky. Sometimes it's random. You know, it'll just seem like it comes down over a hill from nowhere, these like helicopter pups. And then sometimes it's pretty consistent and it comes in these like slow, or, you know, it comes in consistently um, and it's like phases that are happening slower, right? And so the tempo of the day and the, and the type of day can also influence like how likely you are to say, okay, we need to dig in to this and get into max pressure because it's going to stay a while and um that would be i think that would be a time that you might want to like edge out or duck a pack and then get back you know get into the pressure but when it's shifting back and forth rapidly or the pressure's there and then it's not and then it's there and it's not um that would be a day that you might lead back or just tack right stuff like the the positioning that might not matter as much yeah i think the only thing to be careful of is it can get it can be really easy it's in super shifty conditions to to continuously keep leading back. And then you get yourself, yourself stuck in the middle, um, which we've been guilty of plenty of times, is you see a pack coming and then you tack underneath them and you, you lead them back to the middle. And then the next pack comes and you tack underneath them and you lead them back to the middle and you never actually end up getting any leverage to either side of the course. So um, making sure, especially at the top of the course, that you edge out um, and, we kind of we call this like you shut down the leg basically you put yourself between them and the mark and and shut down the leg um so it's awfully tempting when it's very shifty to want to just keep leading back and i think it's okay if you have a long amount of time on that tack but if you're getting stuck in the middle you don't want to keep leading <laughs> yeah especially if it's like a priority for the day is to get to an edge and stay out of the middle which sometimes it is then cruise like it's good for you to when you're approaching packs remind your skipper like we are at the top third, we need to get to an edge, you get one more tack, you know, whatever it might be, because it's- Have oh, you said that before, Maggie? <laughs> no, no, never to you, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, and I want to talk a little bit about um, corner plays, and basically that's like when you are in a pack and you're approaching a corner of a race course. So there are a lot of opportunities to make, you know, make or lose points in corners, especially upwind, I think. And on that first beat, when the racing is usually really tight and everyone's close at the top mark, like this is a pretty critical decision. And so we've always talked about it like relative to the port lay line. And Tim Wadlow actually gave a, US sailing, a webinar to the U.S. sailing team recently, and he came up with this colored lane scenario that we really liked. So this is a, a poor recreation. Sorry, Tim. But um, this is his basic concept, and we just really liked the way he uh, described it. And so... The different colors represent like the different lane options out. And, the, and what we're talking about is like you get into the left corner and now we're thinking about a, an exit option. You know, we've already decided to go left. We're already on that side of the course. We're not, we haven't led back all the packs to the middle. <laughs> you know, we've successfully gotten to a side. And now we're talking like what's our last tack into the, the windward mark. Um, and so there are two parts to this plan. Like number one, why I want to go over like which lanes are best and why we think that and then number two like understanding which lanes you actually can realistically achieve and that kind of all goes back to our ladder run conversation from earlier but let's start with the colors so number two is the best for a few reasons um and I'm sorry number two sorry, green <laughs> green <laughs> not number two green right green lane is the best and okay a few reasons for that when you tack on the port in that green lane you want to think about your distance to the windward mark then when you make your final tack on a starboard. And so this final tack on a starboard, if you tack in the zone, there's always a little bit of risk involved, right? Um, because you might have boats coming in on, uh, yeah, and, and you're, you're tacking in the zone, boats coming in on starboard. So it's a safer bet to tack like four boat lengths out instead of at the mark exactly. Um, and that's that we'll talk about ley lines later, but um, that's just like a little thing to remember that port ley, port ley line, unless you're in like first, second, or third, Port ley lines, there's a little risk associated with that because then you're tacking in the zone to the winner of mark. 
So it's always safer to go port ley line minus four. And if you go minus four, then you have a full tack speed build, and now we're at the zone, which is three bolt lengths to the mark. Happy days, very safe. You also have some decision times, and if you've got spinnakers on your boat, gives your crew a chance to get the controls off, get spin sheet set, whatever it might be. A tack set is always terrible. Like no matter how many times we practice it, tack sets are never good. They're always bad. So skippers, remember that. That's the law. Oh, you agree, right, Steph? Okay, done. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, tack sets are very hard to execute. Okay, so that's why the best lane is not necessarily on that port lay line. There will be days, especially if you're really far out, that maybe the best lane is port lay line if you can nail it from a far distance, but that's harder to do. So anyhow, we think most of the time the best lane is just under port lay line. Um, and one other advantage is that if boats are ahead of you and they're setting, then you're not going to have to sail extra distance to avoid them. And you're not going to sail directly under their spinnakers, which is always hairy. Like you don't always know who can see you and what they're going to do with their course and where they're heading. And so, yeah. Okay. So, so for several reasons, that's our best lane. So that's what we'd call the best one. That's like a comfortable lane, just tacking outside the zone. Happy days. Okay. So then the next best are the yellows. Next best one and two. The reason, the only different, the only thing we think is really different about those two is that if you tack at the next best one, say a shift happens, whatever, someone else gets ahead of you and they tack on you, you know, so you've tacked on a port, you're approaching the mark, someone tacks on you. Okay, we're not going to sit in someone, say it's a tight cover, we're not going to sit in someone's bad air. If they want to, if you want to tack out and clean your air, at, you know, if you're on that first yellow line, no problem. You tack out, you sail three lengths, tack back. Ideally, you've got clean air on that port lay line. Not a major, right? We did an extra tack. We did two extra tacks, but we were not in better. Okay. The reason the second yellow line is next best, number two, is because if someone does tack on you. You don't have that option to tack and sail a few lengths and get to lay line and tack again. Now, our, our bailout option is to sail over lay line, which is disastrous in so many <laughs> ways. It's absolutely disastrous. If you could see our true sail VMG when we overstand ley lines, it's like negative VMG to the mark. It's terrible. <laughs> you're sailing extra distance. You're gonna have to weave through setting boats. You're gonna be like reaching into the mark when other boats are tacking. It's a very confusing situation, so don't do it, okay? We don't wanna be up there. We would rather be, probably rather be in bad air on the next bests than way over ley line in the mistake area. Okay, cool. Um, I want to talk about corner plays from the right, and then maybe that'd be a good time to stop and see if there are any questions about this stuff. That's good. So similar color scheme. I know that's pretty exciting. Um, <laughs> but the reason the green best and best are offset like that is because the first green lane is further down the course. So I know this diagram is hard to see kind of where the where we are, but imagine that first best one on the left. Can you see my cursor like that stuff? Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, so this best is, uh, say we're like one third to two thirds of the way up the beat, you know? So we're in like the middle part of the beat, okay? And we're trying to call a line from a distance. This is the best. This would be like, you have 20% left to sail on port. And instead of sailing that out and trying to wing a lay line from all the way at the bottom of the race course, which you can never do properly, unless you're stuff robo, then we're going to go at like 80%. And then, then we're going to have a chance to make it a little better later. So that's what we think is the best, is like that 80%. If you got all of that you wanted to get out of the right and you can tack whenever you want, that like 80% is usually a sweet spot, 80 85%, whatever it might be. Okay, next best one and two are uh, those yellows. It's the same, same thought here, where if you go in this like 90% range and someone does tack on you, your bail option is pretty okay. You still can like go to lay line, tack back in. Here's the next best two. If you get out to this ley line too soon, you are going to get tacked on. You probably didn't call a good one. Okay, so then we're going to have to either sail extra distance or deal with bad air. So those are both next, not great ones. And this best at the top is obviously laying, nail, la, nailing ley line close to the mark in that top third. And we don't need to touch on the red mistake, right? We don't do that. Never. Okay, cool. So let's just pause for a sec. Oh, no, why don't you talk about blockers and then we'll pause. Yeah, so I think. Um one really important move for executing that play from the right is um, using a blocker. Um, and you can actually do it on both exits, um, but it's a little bit easier when you're coming back on starboard. Um, and so if you, let's say you're going out to the right-hand side of the course and you have a boat on your windward hip and you're like, oh, I'm not quite sure if I can tack, and, you know, if the pack on the left is crossing me or if I'm crossing them. and 
but then you start getting headed and the boat on your hip tacks onto starboard. It's a really good opportunity for you to tack to windward of them and use them as a blocker as you come across um, the course. And basically a blocker is someone who protects your lane for you. Um, in this scenario, the blue boat is the blocker for the red boat because they're going to make any port tack boat either tack or duck them. And so this red boat's in a really powerful position. They have a great lane or a pretty good lane to get across the course. No one is a threat to come and take it unless they can fully cross blue. Really pow big power move on the race course to be able to execute this. Um, Another way to execute it, if you don't have someone on your hip who's tacking off, you can also kind of um, make your own blocker by, let's say you have um, a port starboard scenario where um, you could actually just far, far out, just put the bow down a little bit. So as you get to them, they have to tack and then you put the bow back up um, and you create a little bit of a lane for yourself. Um, obviously you don't want to lose a ton of distance sailing across the course by doing it, but you just crack off like, one or two degrees, force them to tack earlier so that when they tack, you have, um, you can come up and have a nice little lane to lure it of you. But I think this, this blocker move is a total power move. And um, going back to the 80% rule that Maggie was talking about, if you can come across in that green, that best lane, that's like 80% of the way up on the right-hand side of the course with a blocker, you're in a really, really powerful spot. And Steph, what's the distance between, like the lateral distance you need so that they're not affecting your air usually? I mean, I would say like minimum, probably one boat length. Yeah, I think that'd be Maybe tight. more. Anything that like makes you feel comfortable. And I think it, it varies boat to boat in like your fore aft position. If you're a little able to be a little bit more bow forward, you don't need that lateral separation to be as much. But if you're bow back, you need that lateral separation to be a little bit more. Okay, so we were going to pause to see if there are any questions, and I see one in the Q&A. Yep, we have one from Al Hager um, asking us to touch base a little bit more on edging out while still retaining contact with close competitors. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we think about the edging out as um, on a shifty day when you need to get to the edge of the course to get more pressure or be inside on the lift um, and you're not giving up leverage to those around you. So like in this example, the blue boat tacks to windward and the boats to leeward have just a little bit of leverage, but not a ton. Um, and I would, I would particularly use this at the top of a beat um, when you're looking to, to just shut down the leg and really be between the competition and the mark. Or also, if you think that there's, if, it, if there's a geographical reason that you're getting to a side, then generally speaking, like being more to that side than the rest of the boats is advantageous. So, for example, um, if there's a top left shift, and for some reason we've seen that a lot recently on our race courses, that there's a little shift at the top, and it, it always kind of goes five degrees left at the top there, then it really makes a difference whether you want to be the farthest boat left or if you can be in the pack, but still get that lefty versus leading the pack back. And so um, if you're anticipating any kind of like geographical trend, then you'd want to be on the edge of the fleet and like really getting, getting to an edge, not leading them back into the middle. I think that's the, you're contrasting, are you trying to be more on an edge than the pack or are you happy to lead them back into the middle of the race course? Yeah. Yeah, and I think like as you get to the top of the course, you know, even on a sh without the geographical shift, if it's a shifty puffy day and you say like this left shift here is the final shift of the beat and this is where the max pressure is, it's the final shift, like just get into that and, and trust it's going to take you to the mark in a good spot. Yeah, the follow up was, um, that's the part I'm having trouble understanding, doing this at the top of the beat to shut down the leg. I think if you are in a controlling position and you get to the lay line, then that eliminates options for the boats behind you. But if you, you have to ask yourself, is it a risk to get to the lay line? Like, um, and actually that's the slide we have coming up next. Is this, uh, am I risking getting to the lay line too early or can I get there and then give everyone no options? I would say like maybe in this, in this, in the example that we gave, um, the blue boat is probably not the sh in the strongest position where like you'd want to be a little bit more bow forward or bow even um, where you can, really ride out that last shift like on this example the left the last shift from the left ride that out and you're in a strong position um in the most pressure um if you're coming from the right 
um, and these guys aren't on ley line, crossing over, getting that final shift from the right to edge out. Um, it's basically anytime you have more more pressure on that side, you max pressure um, on a really shifty puffy day. And sometimes Steph will um, mention that you see more pressure beyond boats or you see boats going faster beyond them. And um, then that's, that's an indication that we're gonna go past the pack, we're gonna carry on. You know, even if it means like ducking a few people through the pack to get to that better pressure or ley line. You know, if, you're, if they're close but not on ley line and you're at the top third of the beat, instead of like doing two tacks with them and jockeying for position with them and you can get in a clean lane on lay safely and close to the mark, then that's, that would be time to go all the way to lay line too. Okay, so talking about some lay line dangers because after you've chosen your lane out of the corners and you've positioned yourself perfectly on the tacks, <laughs> or on the packs, now we wanna deal with the lay lines. And basically um, this diagram is, interesting sorry i made it so it's not perfect but uh okay so let's say black is like the normal uh wind direction for the beat green would be if there's a right shift and you can see how the ley lines have swung uh they've swung over to the left they've rotated because the ley lines are still 90 degrees right and then if there's a left shift the opposite happens and so if you get on ley line too early like out of the bottom right hand course of the mark um and that ley line changes you've either now sailed extra distance or you are likely to get tapped on and will have to tap twice so that's why we like to talk about that like um 80 sweet spot that allows you to have a you know clearing tack and get to lay line safely um and the other thing is that when you're really far from the mark it's very hard to accurately call the lay line so it's just a really difficult thing to do and to estimate the farther you are from it obviously the harder it is to judge so unless you sail with like a compass on your boat which i don't know how many people have the hand bearing pucks but we certainly do not <laughs> we talked about it <laughs> yeah we sometimes we wished we did yeah <laughs> um okay so i want to talk about when we mark arrivals and what we're aiming for and we're going to do that by talking about what we do not want to do <laughs> which is sail in that um overstood zone and I called it like it's to me, I visualize it as like a, the boats like fan out on ley lines, you know, and they stack up on each other's windward hips. Uh, as you can see, everyone wants a little bit of clean air. So they go a little further and a little further over and a little further over and a little further. And if, when we look at our track races from um, like 20 knots of breeze, people are overstanding by like five, eight boat lengths. And then you double that. And then that's the extra distance that they sailed. So they've exhaled 10 extra boat lengths trying to get clear air on ley line. Like I think actually tacking directly behind someone would have been better um, because you go a little bit slower and you sail, you know, instead of sailing uh, 10 extra boat lengths. But even in lighter it happens. So you can see in this picture, everyone tacks like on the hip, on the hip, on the hip. Then you start fanning. Um, and so in order to avoid getting on that ley line too soon, um, this diagram says like six to 10 lengths, but I think it's really just relative to how big your course is. And we talk about it in percentages. So anywhere in that 20 to 10, percent under ley line but it, all that really matters is that you've got clear air on starboard going up the race course yeah. so that distance might change depending on the boat speed and the boats we're sailing um but but all we want is a lane of clear air that's not on the ley line too soon okay so ley line game <laughs> that's it that's what we call the ley line game <laughs> okay this is a track race from one of our worlds and Paris and Anna are winning the race. They're doing really well. They've got a nice strong cover. They'll continue winning it. But I want you guys to watch Italy and GBR. So Italy's the red boat and GBR is the green one. And right now the rankings, in the rankings, we've got GBR in fifth and Italy in sixth. They're both on Star Wars Tech coming over in that like sweet spot that we talk about, but like 80 to 90% under the course, you know, under that starboard ley line on the course. Um, they've done this undercut thing. But here's the moment I want you guys to look at. So Italy has just tacked. Uh, sorry. So Italy's just tacked. And I would argue they're not in a very controlling position on the boats around them. Right? They've just maybe put one boat that's directly behind them in bad air. But these boats have kind of leverage on them. The, this boat is going to be able to decide what they want to do. And so Italy goes over the here and is in sort of a precarious position because now these boats are on starboard. She's got to avoid them. She's losing distance on these boats that were quite close to her. And I just want to contrast her position with where GBR just tacked. GBR is strong on that boat, strong on that boat. Okay, so now Italy is over ley line, which we talked about is terrible. 
right? They're overly on and all, this whole packet's underneath them. She's had to go overly on because she had starboard boats. And so in order to avoid them, she had to, you know, sail a little bit extra distance tack over. Whereas GBR maintained control of the boat that was to lure of her, tacked in. And then by the time they get to the top mark, GBR is in the same spot that she was before ish, six or seven. And um, Italy is in 10th, but about to lose some more boats even. And they're all going slow and high and trying to pinch and get around that mark. That's an awesome video. Yeah, and check it out. Paris and Anna are winning by a lot. They sailed really well that race. Cool. Yeah, and before, so our next section of this whole chat is uh, to talk about some rules, scenarios that you would have on the upwind beat or um, at the windward mark. Um, and then like some tactical thoughts that go around those rules. Um, and a big shout out to Sail Zing for helping us put together some of these rural situations. Um, John Porter actually created a lot of these scenarios that we were using from Sail Zing. So big shout out to JP for, for doing those. Boat S on starboard tack and boat and P on port tack, both are close hauled, are converging on a B. P will safely cross S. However, they are less than two lengths apart. The wind veers, shifts to the right 10 degrees. S changes her course in response to the wind shifts such that P is unable to keep clear. There is minor contact with no damage or injury and both boats protest. Which boat would, if you were on the protest committee, how would you decide this? Let's pretend that protest was hailed perfectly and this is a valid protest and blah, 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 blah. We're not trying to trick anyone here. There's no- Yeah, which boat would you penalize? And guessing is totally okay. Uh, We've had a lot of these rules chats on the U.S. sailing team and um, with Dave Perry. And it's funny because sometimes people just glance and answer quickly. And then all of a sudden, like 70% of us get like a star report question wrong. So <laughs> don't worry. We're all here to learn. <laughs> and and I, we understand these diagrams are kind of hard to see. All right. So right. we have seven votes for S, five, vote, five votes for P, three votes for both, and three votes for neither. So a little bit of a split answer here. Um, but in this scenario, um, boat S would get penalized um, because the right, as the right of way boat, when they change course, they need to give the other boat room to keep clear. Um, and in this scenario, they did not give the boat room to keep clear. Um, well, even though the wind shifted, the boat, basically port didn't have an out here. Um, and yeah, P didn't get, sorry, S didn't give P room to keep clear. So they break rule 16.1. And Steph, question, just playing devil's advocate because everyone's being quiet on this one. Okay, so say we yelled starboard a million times at them and then I altered up, you know, does that matter? Does that, do the verbal hails help or? No, nope, verbal hails don't matter. <laughs> you have, still have to give when you change your, your course as a right-of-way boat, you still have to give the other boat room to keep clear. Um, and then this is another interesting one. Um, so boat S on starboard tack and boat P on port tack are both close tall, converging on a beat. Um, they both have it perfectly figured out because they know their, their ladder rungs because they <laughs> listen to our chat. <laughs> um, and Sorry, I'm reading the wrong one here. <laughs> um, P tacks, um, tacks into a position just in front of S. Um, when P reaches a close hauled course, she is a few feet clear of S. S, who has not needed to change course prior to that moment to avoid P, immediately luffs above a close hauled course and avoids to avoid contact and protest. Which boat should be penalized? Here's a hint. It's really important here to look at the positions of the numbers on the boats and compare them in the different positions. So they're on opposite tacks on position one, and then in position two, one boat's on starboard, one boat's tacking, and then position three, neither have, yeah, are both are on starboard. And so just keep in mind where they are at those different positions, because those are like snapshots in the time. Good answer to those who answered neither. Um, we thought the protest would be dismissed um, because neither boat breaks a rule in this scenario. So. Good job to those of you who answered that. Um, obviously, while P is on port tack, um, she's required to keep clear by rule 10. Um, and then while she's tacking, she's required to keep clear as well. Um, but as soon as she hits that close haul course, um, she's, she's, in, she's in a position um, where other boats have to start keeping clear of her. So she's completed her close haul course 
um, with yellow not overlapped. Um, and then she becomes the ahead right of way boat in that scenario. So Steph, devil's advocate question. What mm -hmm. if, <laughs> um, what if at position three, you know, when she came down to close hauled course, the starboard boat that's now astern the yellow boat um, had to avoid immediately, like say before blues jib filled, before they came down to close hauled course, uh, yellow had to take immediate avoiding action to avoid a collision. Yeah, then you would penalize B because they haven't completed their tack. Yeah, P under 13 while tacking. Right. Cool. So, and when do you start your tack? Or when are you officially tacking? When you're crossing head to wind. Yeah. So, sails start laughing, you're tacking, you're tacking, and you're tacking. And do umpires look at your sails or do they look at the, yeah, what do they look at to determine the? Um, yeah, your sails when they're crossing um, like the center line of your boat, they'll watch the boom, they'll watch the jib um, crossing from one side of the mast to the other. Yeah, and they also look at the direction you're pointing and they go based off what they think the wind direction was last. So um, they'll, they'll look at the direction of your boat <clears throat> and then they'll visualize, okay, what is like 45 degrees from the true wind direction? That is close hauled. Therefore, when we're down to that angle, that we're on close hauled. Cool. Now, because we did so much chatting about the windward mark, I want to go over the mark room rules, which is rule 18. And this first slide just tells us when rule 18 applies. So to summarize, rule 18, which is mark room, um, it does not apply at a starting mark or an anchor line uh, from the time boats are approaching them until, they, this, until <laughs> approaching them to start until they pass them. Okay, so we are talking about a windward mark for the purpose of the next few uh, questions, but rule 18 also applies at leeward marks and leeward gates. Okay, and that's it, really. If there's an obstruction on the race course, we're talking a different set of rules. Uh, if there's another boat, we're talking a different set of rules. This is like stationary buoys in the water, mark roundings, mark room. That's what we're talking about. Okay, and I want to remind everyone that the zone around the mark is three hull lengths. And if your boat has a spinnaker pole, it's with your pole in. So it's like your actual hull length times three. Um, and that's a good thing to kind of visualize because it's really hard to, to judge accurately. Every time we've done a land drill, we've surprised ourselves with how hard yeah. 349ers are to gauge accurately. And when you're the boat that just barely has an overlap, you want that thing to be like 70 feet long. And when you're the boat that's trying to break an overlap, that thing turns into seven feet long, right? So actually knowing how to gauge that and learning how to reference other boats and where they are, knowing how fast your boat travels in a second. You know, if you've got 20 seconds of sailing to the mark, you're likely not three bowling lengths away. If you've got six seconds of sailing, you know, you might, and you go two bowling lengths a second, or two seconds per boat length, then you know you're three. So knowing how fast your boat goes and how much distance you cover is pretty helpful to start visualizing zones. Okay, so we're talking windward mark when, uh, when rule 18 applies, it went, it's when boats have to leave the mark on the same side and one of them touches the zone, then 18 automatically turns on, it's magic. It's like, ding, this light goes off, right, in our head. Okay, it's like those America's Cup boats when they've got the light. <laughs> yeah. 18 is on, 18 is, okay, we're in 18 when someone touches the zone. Um, it does not apply between boats on opposite tacks on a beach to windward. It does not apply between boats on opposite tacks when the proper course at the mark for one, but not both of them, is to tack. And it does not apply between a boat approaching a mark and one leaving it, so you can't call room on a boat that's setting their kite or heading downwind, um, or if the mark is a continuing obstruction. Okay, any questions about mark or rule 18, what, what we're talking about? Definition of mark room is Room for a boat to leave a mark on the required side, just room to sail the, to the mark when our proper course is to sail close to it, and room to round the mark as necessary to sail the course. Okay, cool. So basically, that means that you get to turn around the mark <laughs> and go to the next mark. And so where the next mark is matters. If, if it's a reach leg, you don't get to go all the way down when to jibe around. Um, and, but if it's a downwind one, then you get to go all the way to the downwind. And uh, just to note, the mark room does not include room to tack unless she's overlapped inside and to windward of the boat required to give mark room to be fetching a mark after a tack, blah, blah, blah. We don't need to worry about that right now. Okay, and so I thought this was interesting that the room is the space the boat needs in the existing conditions. Um, and I think that's an interesting note because uh, you need a lot more room to jibe in heavy air, for example, uh, you know, or you might need more room to bear away, or your bear away might take longer and heavier. And so just, just keep that in mind that sometimes boats might need a little or more uh, room, mark room as necessary given 
the conditions. Yeah. Okay. Real quick, Maggie, we have a, a question. Um, does mark room include finishing marks too? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good question. Good question. Okay. So here is the situation. We've stolen another one from Salesing because they were so well laid out. All right, so let's uh, watch it again. Basically, I want everyone to note that, um, yeah, just take, just make a mental note of where starboard is, you know? Uh, starboard is on starboard this whole time. They entered the zone, but the, the port boat has been in the zone already. Port boat tax in the zone and then, okay, so poll number five. If you were judge, which boat would you penalize? Boat yellow, blue, both or neither? Maybe I should clarify, there was no contact. Yellow was not forced above close hauled. 80% vote for neither, 20% vote for blue. You guys nailed it. Okay, <laughs> if a boat in the zone of a mark to be left to port passes head to wind from port to starboard tack and then is fetching the mark, she shall not cause, okay, this is part to pay attention to, she shall not cause a boat that has been on starboard tack since entering the zone to sail above close hauled to avoid contact. Cool. And okay, so I want to make a note there that basically, if there are boats overstood, it's much safer, right? It's, you have to kind of know where the starboard boats on the ley line are. Are they overstood? Are they on? Or are they thin? If they're thin and barely making the ley line and you try to tack there, they're definitely going to have to go above close hauled, right? They're already pinching to make that mark. And now you make them pinch even more, it's going to be bad news. It's dangerous. If they're overstood, that's going to be much easier to. Uh, you know, tack safely in there and not cause them to go above uh, close all course. Okay, and then the second part is she shall give mark room if that boat becomes overlapped inside her. So if we, um, you'll see the next situation, it's just important to remember, but that's saying if you tack from port to starboard and then a boat becomes overlapped inside you, that then that boat gets mark room if there's room to give it. Yeah, and that leads us into our next question. Um, in this scenario, if you are a judge, which boat would you penalize? So you have um, both boats initially on port, um, one entering the zone on port, and then one entering the zone on um, starboard. Um, the the our F boat um, hits the mark and um, and protests. Who would you penalize? That's this is actually from the case book. We didn't make these ones, these ones up. This one is or the names up. This one's from the case book, which means that there was a protest, there was a decision, and then someone filed an appeal, and then the answer from the appeal makes it into the case book. So 50% voted for boat F, Freebird, 40% um, for boat J, and then 10% um, for neither. Ooh. So um, if a boat passes um, head to wind from port to starboard and then is fetching the mark, she shall not cause a boat that has been on starboard tack since entering the zone to sail above close hull to avoid contact, which is what we just talked about. Um, and she shall give mark room if that boat becomes overlapped inside of her. So this one's a bit tricky because um, you have to note where the boats enter the zone. And I, I mean, if we were if we were racing, it would just be this is a total judgment call for both boats. On um, you know, one boat could think they're outside the zone, and one could think they're in the inside the zone. So I think. Like you said, Maggie, having a really good understanding of where that zone is is super important. Well, the and, and another distinction here that's important is the close hauled issue isn't relevant, right? Because Jaga, boat J went above and you know, crossed over and then tacked. And so there's we don't we can just disregard the first half of the rule. Um, but the second half is the important one, which says she shall give mark room if that boat becomes overlap inside her. And now she is the boat that tacked from port to starboard. And the boat that she's got to give mark room to is the starboard one. So uh, looking at, um, let's look at position two. J2 is crossing F2, no problems there. Then F, then they're both tacked uh, in position three. All good here still, right? Because F did not have to go above close hauled. F did not have to avoid while J was tacking. And J is now giving F mark room. So happy days, right? Position three, everything looks good. Um, Position four is where it gets problematic because now for some reason, Jay headed up and basically in order to, it, it, it's unclear why she headed up so abruptly, but what we do know is that she headed up and F then hit the mark, right? So 
the fact that F hit the mark in order to avoid hitting the stern of J means that there wasn't enough mark room. And so J failed to give mark room when, she, when F became inside overlap. So um, this is our, la our uh, the next poll question is, should boat F, Freebird, be disqualified for touching the mark? 45% would disqualify boat J, which is this boat up here. Yep, and then three of you guys would disqualify boat F. Some said both, some said neither. Okay, basically, ta-da, there is exoneration, rule 21, but it's basically, it's a, it's a protective rule. Exoneration means when you're sailing within the room or the mark room that you're entitled to, you're exonerated. If an incident with a boat required the, to give you mark room or room, it compels you to break rule 31, which is touching a mark. So if you have mark room and a boat does not allow you to sail that, you know, doesn't give you enough room to round, which are determined, you know, the amount of room you get is determined by the conditions to make a seaman like maneuver and sail around the mark. Um, and, and you have to hit the mark as a result of that. And you're either hitting the mark to avoid contact with them or you're hitting the mark in them. You are exonerated from breaking that rule. Uh, and so the answer would be that F is exonerated from hitting the mark. Well, Holt has asked a great question that pertains to, yep. Um, okay. Fine line of when the start, where the starboard boat is above close hold. This is for the mark rounding, Maggie, if you can hear me. Okay. Hi, Will. Yeah, I can hear you. Howdy. Is it, um, it's this Yeah, this, this, this situation, exactly. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So I think, um, there's what the, what the rules say, you know, which would be that they don't go above close hauled, which would be 45 degrees from the true wind direction, blah, blah, blah. There's what the rules say. And then there's what's, there's going to be competitor behavior. And then the next layer is, and what is recounted in the, in the, in the protest room. Okay. So what we've seen in this situation is that if you're the blue boat and someone's clearly overstood, you're tacking, you think there's plenty of room. They're definitely a boat length and a half over lay line, whatever it might be they're gonna aim at you and then aggressively alter up to make it look like you've tacked too close, right? Um, in our boat, that might mean like hitting the water, luffing your jib, all of these things. And, and that's that's sort of showy, that's sort of, uh, we call it like Hollywooding, you know, that's not totally um, sportsman-like behavior, to be really honest, but it does happen. And so you just wanna be aware that if you're the port boat tacking there, the risk is kind of on you and it's very easy for the starboard boat to make judges, umpires, or other competitors think they went above the close hall. So that's it. You, you bring up a really good point. I've been in this protest where we were the blue boat, and uh, we thought it was no incident at all. We actually thought there was distance between our boat when we cleared, when we cleaned the completed the tech. But the questions they asked in the room were: um, they asked about the jib luffing. They asked about the direction we were sailing. We had to talk about how much weight we were putting over you know how hard we were trapping and then what we had to do to you know the other boat said that they had to pull up into their sails which in my opinion didn't happen but anyhow um you know they would make a point about okay you were hiking and then if you go above close haul then all of a sudden you're not hiking you know so how much it's a good thing to take note of if you see uh a starboard boat that's overstood fully hiking and then they're still hiking and they haven't had it up you know you can make that point um but I'm, does that answer your question yeah, it just kind of really depends on what, you know, what what can be proven in the room, or it's it, it's kind of like a it's a tough one for them to decide on. But yeah, it's it, it it's all depends on the situation. Yeah, we'll we'll talk a little bit in just a couple of slides about like, you know, how you can kind of eliminate your risk in this scenario. Obviously, it would just be to duck instead of going in there. Right, and also know you got to know your conditions and the fleet. Like for example, in our fleet, if you're overstood there and you put the bow down and someone's tacking that close to the mark, they're going to be going so slow. Then instead of heading up and avoiding and protesting and making a big deal of it and slowing your boat down, you'd rather just crack off and go faster, you know, just continue bow down and roll over them. So tactically, like, I guess there's a couple things to play, but if, at the same time, um, you, I think you'd want to like a safe distance between the starboard and port boat. So you want to know that when you do tack onto port and complete your tack, that there'd be good distance between your two boats. Um, the closer it is, the harder it is to sell that they didn't have to avoid. Um, and then you can also look for uh, cues on their boat to see if they are overstood. Like, for example, on our, 
in our fleet, if you're overstood your main sheet, you, you know, the distance between the blocks and back is really big. Whereas if you're sailing up normal upwind, it's like that much. But in order to like close reach down in trapping conditions, main sheet's gotta be eased that much. And so that's kind of something you would look at as, okay, they're definitely, they're not on a close hold course already. There might be room to go in there, but it's definitely taking a risk. Cool. Um, do you have a video that you wanna show Maggie? So this would answer your question about tacking too close. This is a really good way to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> Get a little wipe out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you really want to sell that they tack too close, you the cruise, you should stand up and then jump into windward. That's what I'm doing. I thought I would just make it really clear. Oh my god, <laughs> so close and jump overboard. <laughs> Our sea anchor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I think I lost my balance and then went to grab something and just missed. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think a lot of those those rule scenarios just bring light to how you can approach the windward mark in a really smart way. And um, just going back to what we talked about earlier is um, if you're coming in on port, making sure you're coming in a good distance under the ley line so that you set yourself up in a position to not be tacking in the zone. Because as we could see there, there's a lot of risk anytime you do tack in the zone. And I think, you know, if you can always get into like the fine little details of the rules, but if you're trying to just sail clean and stay out of the protest room, you know, ducking one boat to tack on their hip isn't going to hurt you that much. Um, so yeah, one in doubt duck um, or make a plan earlier. Um, you know, port ley line should be minus four boat lengths if you're not winning. Um, and then knowing where the other boats are to relative to ley line. And uh, Maggie touched up based on this just um, in the last slide, but you know, really using those those clues from the other boats of like, do they have a ton of main sheet out? Or are they, um, you know, can you see their jib is eased? Like what kind of clues will give it away that they're maybe overstood and you do have that opportunity to tack underneath? Um, or if a pack is really thin, um, knowing, you know, are, are people sitting in or crouching in more than those who are actually on the ley line? Um, are boats reaching over the top of them? Um, so really using those clues to help you understand where that ley line is. And um, it's something that knowing, knowing exactly where your ley line is is something that's really, really powerful on the race course. And we, we spend a lot of time practicing our ley lines upwind um, and downwind and, you know, having a good feel for where that is and um, just being able to replicate it. I think, you know, it's, it's really a feel thing. Like Maggie said, I wish we could bring a compass out with us, and, but it's just not practical on our boat. Um, but yeah, knowing where those that helps that judgment call also is if you start talking about it earlier, you know, yeah. if, if you get to a crossing or docking situation with a boat and you haven't thought to ask yourself, are they on ley line or are they not? That's the time that you're going to duck them, tack on their hip. They're going to be on ley line. You just gave that boat up completely. So coming into that wind remark, sometimes crews, you should prompt your skippers. Okay. I think they're close. I think they're thin, you know, have a look at this. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, so that wraps up our chat and we'd really appreciate it if anyone could give, if you guys are on social media to give us a follow on our Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Maggie and Steph. That was really some great information. And I think we probably all feel a little bit better with the, the rules. We look forward to the next webinar. Thank you again. And thank you to our sponsors. Stay safe.